So I think the biggest, for us, the biggest takeaway um, is that Americans, people in general in American society are um, really optimistic about how much we share resources in society, economic resources, um, between different demographic groups. In our study, it's about um, black Americans and white Americans. Um, participants in our study estimated that um, things are really fair in terms of economic outcomes, when in fact, when you look at the best estimates uh, based on publicly available economic data, you find wide chasms in terms of um, income disparities between black and white Americans, wealth disparities between black and white Americans, wages and health benefits. Um, so those chasms are huge. They've been wide for decades. Um, and our participants in the studies uh, think that those um, divides are smaller and that they're naturally closing. So when I think about this, I think about the wealth gap, which is the largest. Um, from the um, 1960s um, to like 2015 is where we have economic data. Um, the gap is between white and black Americans in terms of accumulated wealth um, is a gap of about 95 points. So what that means is for every $100 that an average white family has in wealth, a black family, an average black family has five. All right, so our participants, as they are um, trying to make these estimates for our studies, um, they're guessing about how unequal wealth is, accumulated wealth is, um, between black and white Americans. And they think, you know, they might think something like, um, for every $100 that a white family has, a black family has 80, right? So there's a little bit of a gap, but it's closing. But, but it's five and not 80. And that's the magnitude of difference that we see in our studies. We see that everybody sees that there was less equality in economic outcomes between black and white Americans in the past. And so everybody be has beliefs that things are improving. Um, and really what that comes down to is that we can, although we can admit to some inequality uh, in the past, we're much more averse to um, admitting it in the present. Um, we want um, economic inequality between black and white Americans to be sort of naturally um, reducing itself over time. Um, and so the progress findings that we have are largely due to um, these overestimates of current circumstances. A big part of it is this widespread belief in the American dream in our society. Um, and, and, you know, this belief that Americans hold, they have Cinderella stories about it, they have, um, you know, you tell your children stories about overcoming economic obstacles to become, you know, who you're meant to be and successful and talented and, um, you know, have all the, you know, material um, possessions and, um, and social benefits that you might have at the end of your life. That's part of the fabric of American society. Um, and in this case, those beliefs can lead us astray, can lead us to not see the world for what it is, which is that um, essentially there's a lot of work that still needs doing if our reality and our economic reality is going to match up. So there's a sort of, uh, first, a general policy um, pivot that I think this suggests. Um, so we've had, um, in, the, in the public debate, there's been a um, penetration of thinking about inequality in society. And that's great. That's important. Um, and that drives our discussion about creating a society that's fairer, that's more just, and more meritocratic. Um, and you had political candidates thinking about these issues. Um, but that debate, we think, is focused too much on sort of the outsized influence that the top of the distribution has on everybody else. If you create a more equal society by intervening at the top of the distribution, you will still have the problem that we observe in this work, which is 
people with, uh, so white Americans will be on top, black Americans will be on the bottom, and it will have little to do with differences between them in terms of merit, right? It's based on these historical structural factors. What our work suggests, though, is that um, if you take a historical look at inequality, a lot of inequality in our society is built based on the past, is built based on our older economic systems, which are based on discrimination, based on slavery, if you go back far enough. So this means that um, I see black, white, racial inequality in society as, um, as causal to general inequality. The good news about economic solutions, policy solutions, so um, one of the big ones is to really aggressively fight discrimination in home lending practices, um, fight any kind of discrimination in, um, in real estate practices, and really being active about this, because one of the best ways to develop wealth is to own a home. If you solve these kinds of inequalities, these kinds of uh, discriminatory structural practices in society, you will reduce the black-white economic inequality gap, and that will reduce inequality in society more broadly. So um, we see thinking about um, racial inequality in society as a way to solve our general inequality problem. One of the dangers that we see happening is that um, we want to move past issues of race all the time because they are difficult to talk about, because they bring up really painful pasts that we have lived in this country. Um, so we, it's, it's much more comfortable for us to move past this, right? Let's Think about it as something that happened in the past um, and, um, and move on to a brighter future. But we cannot, uh, our paper suggests that um, what happens when you do that is you believe that problems, that economic differences between uh, racial groups in society are naturally solving themselves, are naturally going away. Right? Um, when we, when we perceive that kind of reality, we, um, we can sort of go on with our lives. It feels kind of comfortable. But in doing that, we will miss one of the major challenges in our society. We want our society to be really meritocratic. We want our society to, be, to live up to the American dream. And we can't do that if this exists. And we, and we definitely can't do that if we don't know it exists. In the last few weeks, uh, we've really been reminded of how much work there still is left to do. Um, but I want to caution that it's really painful for a lot of people to live in this moment, right? And so there is going to be a, a natural psychological motivation to want to see this go away, to naturally go away, to see it solving itself in, in the ways in which we like to think of um, economic inequality based on race solving itself, and that's the danger. What we really want to do is we want to intervene on the, the bias that we see, um, and we want to take a more active policy role, a more active interpersonal role in bravely confronting race in our society, um, and having discussions about it, in um, talking with our children about it, um, in conducting business in that way as well. So one of the things that, um, that we find is that um, these beliefs that our overestimates are sort of really optimistic perceptions of inequality in society that uh, are based on race are quite malleable, at least um, in some of our studies. And so when we ask people again, so you've made those estimates of income inequality uh, uh, between black and white Americans, what if we said that we want you to think about an alternative United States, one where discrimination still exists um, in various domains. What do you think the gap is now? That increased accuracy for our participants. So what that suggests is there is a path forward, um, a more honest 
assessment of what our society looks like, as painful as those conversations might be, will lead us to see the world for what it is and may actually actively lead us to have the kinds of policy discussions that will ultimately solve these problems.